Uh, everyone, hi, I'm thrilled to have my friend Max uh, Lugavir join us to talk about Genius Foods. Um, and when I last checked, Max, so maybe an hour ago, you were number 10 in all books on Amazon and number one in nutrition, biology, neuroscience. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Whereas I think yesterday for most of the day, we were at number five. It's been pretty nuts to yeah. be the number one selling health book on Amazon right now. That's pretty crazy. A year ago, did you think you'd be there? I know. I mean, I, I, not at all. Five years ago, if you would have told me that I would ultimately have written a book, I would probably not have believed you. Um, <laughs> but I'm just so thrilled. You know, I worked so hard on this book and, uh, it spans, you know, seven years of research. It's motivated by, you know, a personal passion. And um, I'm just excited to, uh, to have it out there. I also think it's a very unique health book in the sense that it's written in a very easy to read way. It's funny at times, um, but it also has science presented in a way that I don't think has ever been really presented in a book. Well, and, and that's something, you know, since I've known you, uh, you're, you're really good at taking kind of very complex ideas and distilling them in a very accessible way for, for the layman. And uh, that there's a real craft to that. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I find that sometimes people with a more academic background have to unlearn concepts in order to present them to a layperson audience. This is one of the reasons why science communication is so difficult and you very seldom see PhDs communicating science. Right. Um, on the other hand, I learned these concepts from the ground up and I, as a storyteller, have been able to integrate them into, a, into a, an ongoing narrative in my head about how we might eat and live to not only preserve but help the human brain thrive. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's well, how I present it in the book. Well, let's talk a little bit about your storytelling. You know, a lot of a lot of people joining us today are familiar with you um, that are within our community, and and you're a new face to many. So, just want to give a little bit of background to give some context to things as we dive in. Um, but for everyone with us, thank you uh, again for joining us. And Max Lugavere is a filmmaker. He's a TV personality. He's a health and science journalist, and has become a brain and food expert. We'll talk about why that is here in a minute. Um, I came across Max when I found that he was uh, making a film called Redhead, and you know he was doing a Kickstarter campaign to fund that. Uh, it's the first ever documentary about dementia prevention through diet and lifestyle. Uh, he has pivoted or transformed or <laughs> morphed that at this point into genius foods, uh, become smarter, happier, more productive while protecting your brain for life. Uh, he's a contributor to Netscape, Vice, Fast Company, Daily Beast, has been featured on NBC Nightly News. Seems like every other day you're on the Dr. Oz Show, Max. You turn them on, you're there. <laughs> and uh, featured in the Wall Street Journal. So he's a very sought-after speaker and is lectured at very esteemed academic institutions, such as the New York Academy of Sciences, and while Cornell Medicine has given keynotes at events all over the world, and really, really psyched to have you, Max. And early on, you were a journalist for Al Gore's uh, current TV. And, yeah. And was a New York place. and LA, I think you're in LA today, right? I am, indeed, Los Angeles. Yes. So, Max, uh, I know your backstory. I, I know why you got into this, but please share your story and, and why you've written this book. Yeah, so I was coming off of that five-year stint working for Al Gore's TV network and uh, trying to figure out where I was going to go with my career. I liken myself in that phase of my life as being kind of like a stem cell. I was undifferentiated uh, and trying to figure out where I was going to go. I was at this critical point where I had just come off of this incredible job and was uh, really in that make it or break it stage of my life um, career-wise. And uh, at that exact moment in my personal life, my mom started to show the earliest symptoms of what would ultimately be determined as a, uh, a niche form of dementia. And I was at the time represented, I, I just had signed with like a big talent agency for, you know, for TV hosting and I was really excited about my career prospects. But as soon as my mom got sick, I basically became unable to think about anything else. And uh, my passion really was ignited by trying to understand what 
had happened to my mom, how it happened, if there was anything that I, that I could do to help her. But very much in tandem with that, it became about how I could pretend, prevent this from happening to myself and others that I care about. Um, it became all I was able to think about. I began uh, digging into the primary literature. Um, in simultaneity, my, uh, my career, because of, because of this, was in a tailspin. My agency dropped me from their roster. Um, I was basically, I decided to move back to New York and, and live with my mom to try to figure out what was going on and really kind of free myself of financial burden so that I could really dedicate myself to the research. And that was about six years ago. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I've just become very passionate about learning as much as I possibly can from the top experts in the world, doing my own research and whatnot. And, you know, not once along the journey did it, did it, uh, did it seem that not having a medical degree was a barrier to the kinds of answers that I wanted? You know, we live in an amazing time where all of the world's research is out there on the internet. We have access to it. And my unique uh, situation and stature gave me the ability to reach out to researchers who typically don't, you know, if you're just a civilian trying to reach out to a PhD, usually you don't get a reply to your email, you know, but, but you know, a few of them replied to me and, what I found actually was pretty surprising. They, they, with open arms, wanted to share their research with me because, you know, here was this young guy passionate about dementia prevention, which very few people were talking about at the time, and let alone young people. So, um, so yeah, so I've been able to, to garner this, this, this expertise, and it began about dementia prevention, but ultimately it really, it really brought in to include the full breadth of ways that our diets and our lifestyles affect our brains and how, and their ability to thrive. Um, and so that's what, that's what genius foods is, is really about. Yeah, Max, I, I want to step back and, and I know the story, but it's a powerful one. When was that first moment you knew something wasn't right with mom? Yeah, I was, uh, she had begun complaining about brain fog and things like that, um, over the phone. But it wasn't until a family trip to Miami where me and my brothers and my mom and my dad were all under the same roof. And formally, my mom announced to the family that she'd been having memory problems and also that she had recently uh, sought the help of a neurologist. And we were completely ignorant. I mean, we didn't have any kind of neurological problem in our family tree. So, I mean, my dad you know, it sort of antagonized her in that moment and asked her, you know, if that's so, then what year is it? And it took my mom a couple of beats. Um, and to break that, that silence, that awkward silence, me and my brothers who were sitting there in the living room chimed in. We we're like, come on, mom, how could you not know the year? And she was, she was struggling so hard that she actually began to cry. And that was the moment that, uh, that I realized that something was probably pretty serious and um, and that I need to step in and really go with my mom to doctor's appointments. You know, I had a, a passion for health and I also had this background in journalism. So it gave me the ability to, even in those doctor's office, to maintain, you know, a bit of skepticism um, and, you know, ask the right questions, questions that a, a, a patient in that moment of fear and confusion and helplessness probably, you know, wouldn't ask. So I went with my mom and I, um, it ultimately led to us going to the Cleveland clinic and it was there that for the first time my mom was diagnosed with a, a neurodegenerative disease. You know, the physician spent 15 minutes with my mom and, uh, wrote prescriptions on two drugs for two diseases that would ultimately change my life. You know, my mom was prescribed for the first time, um, a disease, a medication for Parkinson's disease and a medication for Alzheimer's disease. So... Wow. Yeah. That was it. That was the line in the sand that really, uh, you know, I went back to LA. I tried to re-engage with my, my career, my TV work and stuff like that. And I just was, all I wanted to think about was what might cause a person to become demented. And, you know, I stumbled upon some very uh, interesting insights at the time that were um, fairly niche in terms of their prevalence in the medical literature, but the notion that 
Alzheimer's disease might be a form of diabetes of the brain. Um, that type three diabetes, right? Type three diabetes. Yeah, I stumbled upon that insight very early on, and it just was like it was a paradigm shift for me. I um, I became kind of obsessed, and uh, yeah, I had kind of in my back pocket had some exposure to the notion that diet affects the brain. I was a big fan of Terry Walls, mm-hmm. who. Um, She's a physician who developed progressive MS who had become famous via a TEDx talk that went viral for um, claiming that she had essentially treated her MS through diet. And that was really my first exposure to the notion that diet affects brain health. And I kind of just, I remembered that watching that TED talk, um, it was kind of prescient because it, uh, you know, I, it resonated with me when I watched it, but it, you know, I didn't think that it had any real relevance to my life. Um, but lo and behold, it ultimately did. And, um, and so I started to look into how diet and lifestyle might affect, you know, one's predilection for Alzheimer's disease, which is a different disease than MS, but lo and behold, you know, many of the principles are the same. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as, as you've been doing your research, Max, and you're, you're seven years into, um, a journey that has no, um, visible endpoint to yeah. it. What's the most surprising thing you've learned along the way? Well, there, I mean, there's so many, but I think, you know, one of, one of the things that really shocked me was that most of the time, uh, dementia and particularly Alzheimer's disease begins decades before the first symptom. Um, so I had previously considered Alzheimer's disease an old person's disease, but I was completely wrong. You know, with the oldest millennial now approaching the age of 40, this is very much something that young people need to be talking about. And I don't just mean as potential caregivers for their parents. I mean, you know, as, as potential patients ultimately down the line. I mean, if you reach the age of 85 today, you have a 50% chance of being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So essentially, if you want to know whether or not your fate includes being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, flip a coin. Those are your odds today. And that's just, you know, heartbreaking to say the least and and I would say you know on the other hand it became very much about how to really bring this conversation down to a younger audience um you know I've been over the course of my career and and you know you've you've definitely we've been friends for a long time you know so tell me if it's if it's been working but I've really been trying to walk this tightrope between staying true to you know, my passion, which is dementia prevention, but also trying to talk about it in a language that is, you know, for lack of a better term, sexier, so that young, young people care about it. Like when I wrote Genius Foods, and you'll notice from the cover that there's no dementia language whatsoever. You know, my goal is really for it to be a Trojan horse, actually, so that young people that are interested in reducing brain fog, you know, reducing depression, anxiety, thinking happier, thinking with more, you know, agility, will read the book and ultimately, perhaps inadvertently, prevent their own dementia. That's like- A a happy accident. A happy accident. That's my secret goal for the book. (laughs) Well, your secret's out. My secret's out. Secret's out, and it's good. And and I think the book is a great Trojan horse. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the messaging is, you know, very on point. And when we look at these odds, the 50-50 odds, the toying costs, dementia or not, you know, this is a way to improve your odds. Yeah. You know, make some changes. Absolutely. And, you know, you talk about making it sexy. I'm just going to throw out one of the terms in the book. What in the heck is biochemical liposuction? (laughs) (laughs) That is a, yeah. I mean, that's something that I feel like a lot of people would be interested in. Um, For sure. It's as simple as allowing your body to tap into its stored fat as a means of uh, energy creation. So, you know, your average pound of fat that we each carry around our waists and our hips contains about 3,000 backup calories that the brain is happy to use for fuel. In fact, the brain loves using fat as fuel. But too frequently today, we're consuming diets that are based on carbohydrates. Um, and particularly in the modern food environment, 
those carbs usually come from ultra processed foods that now make up 60% of our, of our calorie intake. Right. And these foods, what they do is they keep a, uh, an ancestral hormone in our bodies called insulin chronically elevated. And when insulin is elevated, it's like a one way valve on your fat cells. So basically calories can flow in, they can't come out. And so by allowing insulin to come down with a very low carbohydrate diet or with intermittent fasting, you essentially allow this process, which I've called in the book, um, biochemical liposuction to occur because it becomes like a liquidation event at your favorite clothing store. Essentially like these fatty acids get liquidated and right. they get sent out into your bloodstream. Your liver then converts them uh, for use as fuel. And that's essentially, you know, your brain loves that. Right. Those ketones get pushed into the brain. The brain can potentially derive about 60% of its energy requirement from these fats. And ketones seem to be a very clean burning fuel source to the brain. Um, not only that, but certain brains may work better uh, when ketones are available. And ketones also have a number of, um, just aside from, their, from the fact that they can be oxidized and used as fuel, they flip a bunch of switches in the brain that seem to be very beneficial. Um, they promote uh, the expression of BDNF or brain derived neurotrophic factor, which is a, a it's been called a miracle grow protein for the brain. They um, increase availability of uh, glutathione, which is considered to be the mother of all antioxidants. And um, they also can potentially increase uh, blood flow to the brain, which is important because that seems to decrease with typical aging. Mm -hmm. um, so increasing blood flow to the brain, allowing, you know, your brain to receive blood and fuel and nutrients, uh, very important. And especially so as we get older. So in your research, have you found that you, you actually have to get to the point of ketosis to get the ketone release to get into those deep fat stores to burn for energy? Yeah. There's two ways to, um, supply ketones to the brain. You can either produce them on your own by way of a ketogenic diet or um, fasting, um, or you can eat certain ketone producing foods. So you can consume foods like medium chain triglycerides, which is a, a fraction of coconut oil. So coconut oil um, has There's a lot of pushback on coconut oil right now. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't, I think that, um, I don't think that, you know, I think that there's cognitive benefits, but I think, people have really started using it liberally. And I think, um, you know, it's always better to create your own ketones, you know, as the, as one of the two routes to ketone, um, entry into the brain. But, but no, I mean, I think coconut oil is good, but even better probably in terms of its cognitive benefits is pure MCT oil, right? which is just a more concentrated form. And the whole point of consuming coconut oil would be for these MCTs. So I'd rather get a more concentrated form. And it, what seems to happen is that these ketones, get then pushed into the brain, whether or not you are in a, a ketotic state. Right. Um, Mary Newport, who you know, is uh, one of the earliest um, sort of advocates for coconut oil and MCT oil use for Alzheimer's brains. Um, there's also a range of exogenous ketone products now on the market. They've flooded the market. I think for, for their cognition improving effects, I think that they're, they're, they're potentially beneficial. Yeah. Very little uh, you know, real research on them, but what is out there, I think is, um, it makes me optimistic that, um, you know, especially for patients with Alzheimer's disease, that they could be used as a, as a, as a potential adjunct treatment along with everything else. You know, it, it's interesting. I, I go through, um, periods of putting myself into ketosis and, and then out of ketosis. And, you know, what I, what I found, you know, through, um, generally a, a paleo, diet um, is how I'll achieve that. And we'll supplement with uh, the medium chain triglycerides using MCT oil uh, is that my <clears throat> energy levels, my clarity of thought, um, my eye color, my skin tone, um, just my overall being, I feel healthful. Wow. When, I, when I'm in that state. And when you shift and you begin to regress and go out of ketosis, you would be feeling like crap again. Yeah. Like, I really want to get that back. And I think so few people realize we're walking around feeling terrible and that's become the norm. 
And until we get an experience through going into ketosis, experiences with intermittent fasting, do we realize just how great we can feel? I mean, do you, do you find that? Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's about getting back to that balance. Um, you know, we, it's, you know, no secret now that when we're fasted, we tend to feel more alert. Um, and being in a, in a ketogenic state allows your body to kick on certain processes that are related to health span um, and promoting longevity. Autophagy is one of them. Um, it's sort of your body's waste disposal mechanism. It sort of grinds up worn out dysfunctional proteins and, uh, you know, can convert them actually to sugar to be burned off by the brain. Um, and so, yeah, it, it does promote a more, I think, youthful body. I mean, certainly being chronically not in ketosis is not evolutionarily sound. Um, and especially when it's uh, driven by the, the kinds of foods that now make up the bulk of our calorie intake. I mean, these foods promote accelerated aging, inflammation, uh, things like that. So, you know, and I'm, I'm just as much as I'm a fan of being in ketosis. Um, you know, I think that, uh, really what I, what I promote is more of what I call intermittent ketosis, uh, because, you know, I don't think it's necessarily good or even, um, necessary to be in ketosis all the time. Right. Um, you know, I think there are benefits to having an occasional insulin spike. Um, I think, you know, carbs are not evil. They're just misused today. Uh, we're sedentary, you know, we're, we're eating just really rapidly digesting carbs. We've removed fiber from our diets. Um, so I think, yeah, just, uh, getting back to that balance is, uh, is of critical importance. So, you know, talking about the balance, let's kind of go through a, you know, a punch list. What are the kind of the top foods that we should be eating for a better brain? You know, what, well, what, what's our top 10 list? Top 10 list. Well, definitely avocado. Um, I can go through all the foods and I could just give you some, some bullet points. I mean, an avocado, <laughs> highest concentration of fat protecting antioxidants of any fruit or vegetable, rich in fiber about 12 grams of fiber per avocado, double the potassium of a banana. Um, powerful, as I mentioned, carotenoids that boost brain processing speed, healthy fats. Um, so I try to eat a half to a whole avocado every single day. And they're delicious. And they're delicious. <laughs> uh, extra virgin olive oil should be the chief oil used in your diet. People are obsessed now with, with avocado oil. I think as, as, a, as a food, avocado is great, but the oil that you want to be using is extra virgin olive oil. Um, it's really tasty on top of the avocado. That's true, with a little bit of salt. Delish. Sea salt. Actually, yeah, I'm a fan of actually uh, uh, real salt, which is made in Utah. Yeah. 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 We've got shakers of it at the office and at home. It's fantastic. It's the only salt I use. Yeah. Uh, so um, Avocados, extra virgin olive oil. We got grass-fed beef, which I think is a total health food. Um, Grain-fed beef, not so much. Um, it's better not to eat meat if you're going to eat grain fed beef, but if you've got a piece of grass fed, um, two to four servings a week, I think is, uh, perfectly healthy and supplies you with a myriad of really important brain building nutrients. Now I, so I, so I agree with that. And in fact, if you had the view out of my window, um, the, the spring calves that are out in the fields outside of advanced brain technologies that are all grass fed, they're not grain finished. Wow, great. You know, we can watch our beef growing growing out the window. And I think people here a lot eat grass-fed beef, but why not grain-fed beef? Well, for one, grass-fed beef has triple the vitamin E uh, as compared to grain-fed beef, which is really important because it's, you know, it's all about nutrient density. So when you take a piece of beef, you want to be imbibing as many nutrients as you possibly can for that level of calories. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that, I'm not a fan of eating huge amounts of, of added saturated fat in the diet. I think the, pen, the high fat pendulum is now swinging in a direction where people are putting butter in their coffee, coconut oil in their smoothies. Um, I think it's very telling when you look at the fat, fatty acid ratios of a properly raised cow that there's less saturated fat in it. It sort of gives you a hint as to, to the proper mm -hmm. you know, physiological ratio of, sat, of fats that you want to consume. 
Right. Um, and of course, carotenoids, uh, the fat of grass fed beef is rich in, in the same carotenoids that are found in dark leafy greens. This is because grass contains carotenoids, whereas co corn doesn't. Um, and the cows eat the grass, the carotenoids embed themselves in the fat. Same thing happens to us when we eat lots of vegetables. Um, the other food that I would say is uh, of critical importance are eggs. Um, egg yolks are a top source of choline, which um, the brain needs to create healthy neuronal membranes. It's also a precursor to acetylcholine, which is an important neurotransmitter involved in learning and memory. So if you want to remember better, um, you know, choline is a very important uh, um, compound. Um, it used to be classified as a vitamin. Um, until scientists realize that we produce it in our own bodies, but we do not produce enough um, to uh, facilitate good health, proper health. So we need to consume it. Um, there's a, a you know recommended daily intake of choline that, uh, or an adequate intake of choline that we need to meet every single day. And an egg provides uh, about a fourth of that. That's good. I have four every morning, so I'm getting all of it. There you go. Well, that's why you're, you've are you got an advanced brain. <laughs> if only. <laughs> so far, the, the food list is pretty good. Um, and, and something I want, want to bring up, because well, I'm sure we're going to be you know moving into um, maybe legumes, and we'll have a discussion around that, and, and nuts, and of course, fruits and vegetables. But how important is it that our food's organic? I recommend for people yeah i think for people on a budget it's uh i would defer to the you know environmental working groups dirty dozen list and i would buy those on organic i don't think that everything you buy needs to be organic i certainly don't buy organic avocados um i don't buy i buy pasture raised eggs but i don't uh necessarily see a need to buy organic pasture raised eggs yeah um you know if you have uh if you have a surplus of, of money, um, then I say, why not, you know, buy everything organic. But I think for most people, um, that are feeding their families and whatnot, I would, you know, defer to for produce the dirty dozen list. And then for, um, you know, meats and eggs and things like that, I would make sure grass fed pasture raised. Those are my two. Well, that that's, I think, good balanced advice. Yeah. Cause when you go to, when you go to whole checkout, yeah, exactly whole paycheck to check out and <laughs> exactly it's organic. It's uh, very painful. Yeah. Um, but you certainly feel great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I'm very happy that my, my work has allowed me to, you know, make a living, but I'm not rich. Like I, you know, I'm, I want to buy, you know, I want to like, I want my bucks to spread as widely as they can. So, yeah. Um, you know, nobody makes documentaries and, and writes books to get rich. I just want to get this information out there. And I think, I think that's important. You know, I think that, um, uh, and I, I'm, you know, I'm my only dependent. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, no, it's, it's good advice because I, you know, I think people are often all or nothing and, and having a balance in that dirty dozen list is a, a great recommend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've got the gamut from the avocado and the olive oil and grain fed beef, uh, grass fed beef, excuse me, and eggs. Uh, what, what else is important for us to be eating? Fatty fish, wild salmon, sardines, low mercury, rich in brain building fats and uh, carotenoids, marine, unique marine carotenoids that um, help protect the brain against oxidative stress. Uh, dark leafy greens, the consumption of dark leafy greens is related to 11 years reduced um, brain aging. So I try to eat a huge fatty salad every single day, full of spinach, arugula, kale, things like that. Um, cruciferous vegetables. So those are not necessarily dark leafy greens, but broccoli, radishes, things like that. Um, those are really important. Not so much for the nutrients that they contain, although they do contain an abundance of nutrients, but they contain certain chemicals that interact with our genes in very powerful ways, increasing uh, our own body's production of very powerful antioxidants. Um, next, we've got dark chocolate. So, Good news. 
Yeah, dark chocolate's great. Good news. Rejoice. Full of flavanols that seem to boost cardiovascular health and functioning of the hippocampus, the brain's memory center. Um, and also, even in young people, habitual chocolate consumption is related to better memory. Um, so you definitely want to eat a, dar- a bar of 85% or higher dark chocolate per week. That's what I recommend. Yeah. Stay away from the milk chocolate, though. Stay away from the milk chocolate, exactly. Which, which is what most of the young people are consuming. But fortunately, you see more and more dark chocolate on the shelves. Yes, I know. I'm people are, are, are buying that, which is yeah. great. Yeah. I think we've got two more. We've got almonds and nuts in general. Yeah. Um, almonds are potent uh, source of vitamin E. And also a little bit of prebiotic fiber in the almond skins. Mm-hmm. But really, all nuts are great for different reasons. Um, I like to eat them raw, generally. Um, pistachios are actually a favorite. They've got small amounts of resveratrol, which has been shown to promote longevity in animal models. Um, and also, they're a good source of carotenoids. They're unique among nuts in that what you know that yellow-green color that you see in pistachios, those are carotenoids that directly promote uh, better brain function. And then finally, low sugar fruits like blueberries, um, strawberries, raspberries. Blueberries in particular, though, have been shown to um, really help uh, memory function and um, be associated with uh, reduced brain aging by up to two and a half years in high berry consumers. So these are all the foods that I highlight in the book as being, as having a, a very, you know, significant, what I've determined to be a uh, significant mem- uh, research base to say that these foods um, seem to promote optimal brain function and can help minimize uh, accelerated brain aging. Um, so, yeah. So I- I'm going to attempt to push two more on the list to make it a 12. Let's do it. So um, we're right or wrong, but it seems like every other day, coffee is great for your brain. Coffee is bad for your brain. Well, I think what have you seen in the literature? The weight seems to support coffee. Um, Everybody's different, obviously. Cheers to that. Yeah, I've got my iced coffee right here. Uh, It's actually America's number one source of polyphenol antioxidants. It's really high in a compound called chlorogenic acid, which is anti inflammatory. Um, You know, caffeine is a stimulant to the central nervous system. So if you've got a lot of stress in your life, which many people do, then maybe you are oversensitive to coffee and it's not the right thing for you. But rather than throw out the baby with the bathwater, I think it's more important to deal with stress and have a a healthy means of dealing with that stress than to um, really avoid coffee. But, you know, it's personal taste. You don't have to drink coffee. Um, But it does seem to be, the consumption of it does seem to be related to reduced risk for MS, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's. Okay, we're going to go for number 12, red wine. Red wine. In or out? Tricky. Um, You know, the benefits of alcohol consumption, well, we all know that it's a powerful social lubricant. It helps us de-stress. Those are non-trivial benefits um, for most people. So I think in that sense, alcohol is probably very beneficial. The the ethanol might serve as as a, it might promote like a hormetic effect in the body, which is essentially like, you know, ethanol is a poison, but... Maybe in a way it helps stimulate our body's own defense mechanisms. The consumption of moderate amounts of alcohol seems to be protective. Um, So, you know, that's one glass a day for women, one to two glasses a day for men. But just being somebody who has consumed alcohol in the past, that seems like a lot to me. I would not want to drink two glasses of wine a day. Right. Um, You know, even though that's what the current recommendation include so to me it just i think if you're if you can do without it do without it um you know there are some antioxidants in various you know i mean whiskey has something called egalic acid which uh i think is associated with reduced could could potentially help uh fight cancer maybe probably shown in in vitro research but um red wine has resveratrol right things like that i mean there are some antioxidants but you know by and large uh, you know, I think if you can get away without it, that's fine. No need to add alcohol to your diet. Yeah. Good. Good. Whereas the other foods that we've talked about, I recommend having in your diet, you know, what's on the no list, the no list, um, 
grain and seed oils, you want to cut those out, throw them out, go to your kitchen right now and uh, clear out the grapeseed oil, corn oil, soybean oil. Um, these oils are toxic. Um, the production of them creates trans fats at the very least. They're also promotive of a, an imbalanced omega-3, omega-6 ratio. Um, we're over consuming omega-6 fats. They're also predominantly polyunsaturated fats, which now make up about 10% of our calorie intake, up from virtually 0% at the turn of the century. So these are fats that you know confuse our bodies, drive inflammation, and um, seem to promote uh, you know ill health. Um, so I, I recommend cutting those out. Added sugar, processed foods, things like that. Those are, I mean, you know, Alex, you have a pretty savvy audience. So I think most people these days are aware that sugar is not great. Um, but, you know, in the book, I talk a lot about ultra processed foods and the fact that these foods are designed to be hyper palatable. Essentially sending your brain to a bliss point beyond which you can't really control yourself. So, you know, a lot of people tend to think of it as being a moral failure when they go through that entire bag of chips in one sitting or pint of ice cream you know, but really these foods are designed to be overconsumed, and they interact with our brains in very powerful ways. It sends off the equivalent of the 4th of July fireworks in our brains. When we, when we taste foods that have fat, sugar, and salt combined. Um, and so, you know, these are, I think that's one of the, the more under-recognized uh, reasons by which these foods really present such a, such a powerful danger, because it makes it really, you know, it's, it just throws our willpower out the window. Well, there, there is none. I think if people understand that it, it is this addiction <clears throat> reward feedback loop in the brain, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the same as any drug, these processed foods function and are working that same network. Yeah. You, you get the reward, you get the drop, you come back, you take another and spike, we've got it again. Um, so you're just in this constant cycle and the more you feed it, the more you need to feed it. Exactly. Exactly. Highly problematic. And I've been there too, you know, like I've gone through yeah. the pint of ice cream, the bag of chips. We all have. Yeah. But I think it's just now with my book and with, you know, when people listen to this webinar, at least it's going to be informed consent. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm curious too, in the book, you talk about thermal exercise. Mm -hmm. You discuss that a little bit. A little bit, yeah. I'm curious. So, I mean, yeah, we've evolved, you know, at a time when we had to chase our food, particularly carriers of the most well-defined Alzheimer's risk gene. You know, it's sort of considered the ancestral risk gene. Um, and, uh, and, but physical exercise is not the only form of exercise that we had, you know, we, that we had to contend with. We were honed under the hot East African sun, and so temperature stress, thermal stress is um, something that seems to have a number of really uh, beneficial impacts on our bodies. Um, one of the ways in which that works is that, uh, you know, when we're exposed to heat stress by way of saunas, it actually promotes the expression of what are called heat shock proteins. It sort of act like little building scaffoldings to the other proteins in our bodies, protecting them against misfolding. So Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease are defined in part by this, um, overabundance of misfolded proteins, uh, amyloid in Alzheimer's and alpha-synuclein in Parkinson's. So by activating heat shock proteins, that's just one of the many ways in which um, saunas can help promote uh, you know, health. And research out of Finland showed two years ago for the first time at the population level that um, people that used saunas four to seven times per week had a remarkable risk reduction for Alzheimer's disease by about 65%, which is striking. And that and was what, 18 minute durations approximately? I believe about half an hour, half hour durations. Okay. Although, you know, yeah, that seems to be really sort of the threshold, but everybody's different. You know, if you have a medical condition, definitely get the approval from your physician. Um, Cause you know, these are, they're called heats. It's called heat stress for a reason and heat shock for a reason because it actually is a stress on the body. So if you're an older person, if you're dealing with anything, you know, these are these practices are not without risk. So uh, well it it's you know, it's a practice that I started and, and I read something you posted and I'm getting 
six days a week of 20 minutes to an hour Great. of heat stress at 170 degrees in a dry sauna. But what I'm doing is intervals with cold. Yeah, I like that. So I, I'm trying to do the extreme thermal stress of uh, heat as long as I can stand it and then the cold shock and then get back into it. And it's certainly invigorating. Oh my God. I'm religious about it. I think it's one of the best things, you know, just in terms of, you know, really kind of kicking on like very powerful mental acuity. Yep. Um, cold exposure too is just very powerful, very powerful. So have you uncovered any new research on the role of sleep and brain health? Um, I talk a bit about the glymphatic system and how to optimize that and also the links between dietary patterns and and sleep that seems to be promotive of optimal glymphatic function. Um, so the glymphatic system, for people who don't know, it's this newly discovered system in the brain that helps clean your brain out of proteins that aggregate and can accumulate to toxic levels uh, in the brains of, of Alzheimer's patients. Um, and so that occurs when you sleep. And it seems that eating a higher fiber diet uh, promotes more time spent in slow wave sleep, which is the phase of sleep during which the glymphatic system becomes activated. Yeah. So these are the genius plan, the genius diet. It's all calibrated to account for all of these things. Um, it's, a, it's a higher fiber diet. And that's because, you know, one of, the, one of the ways that a high fiber diet can potentially promote this is by reducing inflammation in the body. So eating more fiber is associated with longevity more successful aging. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, it's one of the many omega threes also seems to promote proper glymphatic, um, clearance. It's a newly discovered system, so we don't have all the answers, but, um, sleep is just, you know, incredibly important. It's, uh, you know, it makes up, I talk about sleep in a chapter of the book. Um, the thing is, you know, when telling people about sleep, you know, the, the take home message really is to s sleep more and sleep better. Nutrition is a bit more complicated, obviously. So, um, the bulk of the book is food focused, but I definitely, it is, there is a lifestyle plan in there as well. So, you know, talk a little bit about that. If you could, what, what is the genius plan? What is a day in the life of a, uh, genius <laughs> look like? Yeah, well, it's um, so you're waking up, you're not eating for an hour or two after you wake up. Okay. Um, so are, not, not waking up and going to 30 grams of protein, which um, is needed in some yeah. schools, but actually um, that hour or two delay. And does that tie into intermittent fasting and when you stop eating later in the day? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah. So essentially intermittent fasting, a lot of people get hung up over the hours, but what I recommend is, you know, don't get hung up over the hours, just, you know, uh, honor your body's natural circadian inclination to, um, carry out various processes. When you first wake up, there's a hormone in your body called cortisol that's elevated. Um, it's the highest, it peaks at about 45 minutes after you wake up. Um, and that hormone, what that hormone wants to do is liberate stored fuels for use to be burned off. Um, so you're literally in like a peak fat burning state when you first wake up. Consuming food on top of that is only going to screw that up. Um, but that doesn't last very long. So an hour, two hours after you wake up, um, eat your first meal. The Genius Plan, I also recommend, as I mentioned, a huge fatty salad every single day to check off those, those boxes with your dark leafy greens. Maybe you could throw in the egg, douse it with extra virgin olive oil. Um, that's one of my hallmark rules. Uh, then, you know, I try to concentrate all of the food that I'm eating into two meals. Um, but if you do choose to snack, I provide some options. Again, nuts, dark chocolate. Those are very, uh, I think, good snacks. Half an avocado. Um, celery sticks. Uh, I'm a fan of, I'm actually a fan of pastured pork rinds, which I know, you know, is not for everybody. They're great. Yeah. 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 I love them. Um, sprinkled with a little nutritional yeast. Oh my God. Um, and then yeah, stopping eating for two to three hours before you go to sleep seems to help also, uh, promote, um, or could potentially help promote, um, glymphatic clearance there. I don't think there's been any research, but hypothetically, 
Um, you know, we don't, insulin seems to interfere with that process. And so we, we essentially want to re, you know, maintain tighter reins on our body's insulin production, which chronically elevated insulin might, uh, cause up to 40% of Alzheimer's cases, according to, uh, research published in the journal of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so, so it's, it's maintaining tighter reins on that, on that insulin production. And, um, yeah. And so. That's it. That's, uh, that's, you know, those are some of the key bullet points. Okay. It's that easy. That easy. You know, I think one of the, you know, one of the challenges people have, and you know this, um, and, and the length of time varies for everybody, but really Genius Foods is about adopting, it, the word diet is wrong. Yeah. It's a new lifestyle. Exactly. Making different choices um, in, in that lifestyle. And that can take time. And I think people, you know, will punish themselves if they get off the rails a little bit and go all or nothing. But I think the, you know, what Genius Foods brings forward are, you know, here are some solid science-based recommendations. Um, by the way, it's a great way of eating. It feels wonderful to do. Uh, and even if people make small choices and begin to slowly adopt some of these practices, I think in, in time, you know, the uh, benefits are going to be multifold for them. Yeah, well, thank you for that. You're absolutely right. It is 100% a, um, a lifestyle. It's not a diet. Yeah. Um, I want it to, you know, I want the book to pass the test of time. And communicating science as we currently understand it regarding all this stuff is, you know, very important to me to do accurately. And you'll, I think people will get that in the book. Yeah. Uh, one important liquid we didn't talk about, and I carry this everywhere, filled with water. Yeah. How much water do we need to be uh, consuming daily and how important is it? <laughs> you know, eight cups a day is the, is the standard recommendation. Um, everybody's different. Uh, certainly if you do things that are diuretic, you know, if you drink a lot of coffee, um, if you exercise, if you spend a lot of time in the sauna, you're going to want more water. You're also going to want to re replace lost electrolytes like sodium. So I actually sprinkle a little bit of that real salt in my thermos and I bring it into the sauna with me. Okay. Very important. I recommend doing that by the way, um, to help. But, but not in plastic. Not in plastic. No, no. Um, but yeah, mild dehydration can affect cognitive function. So that's a, that's a bad stress. The body does not want to be dehydrated. Right. So I recommend drinking yeah, water. First thing I do when I wake up is I drink a big glass of water. Yeah. As we're, we're, we're wrapping up and, and I know you've, your press schedule right now is just slammed. <laughs> so you're, you're showing up everywhere in my, in my <laughs> social feeds, Max. I, I can't turn you off and it's a great thing to see my friend. Amazing. As you were researching Genius Foods, what most shocked you? Well, I would say in, a, in, a, in the positive sense, just how plastic our brains are, how malleable and how responsive they are to the inputs that we feed it. Um, you know, I began my journey investigating what we might do to prevent dementia, but where it ultimately took me was just to realize the full breadth of how our moment to moment cognitive function is really something that in a non-trivial way falls under our control. You know, I mean, we can't control, you know, we, we, we're, we are stuck with uh, the brain that we have, but the way that it functions is something that um, we have a huge say in. Um, and, and that's really what inspired me to write the book, you know, um, everything from executive function, your ability to make decisions, plan, have impulse control, delay gratification, tune out distractions, pay attention. These are all cognitive processes that rely on physiologic structures in the brain, you know, tiny structures, you know, like the cell membrane. And I talk about optimizing all of these things in, uh, in the book. Well, here's mine. Amazon was great. <laughs> Landed on release day. Nice. They, they did their job. Uh, it's a beautiful piece of work. I'm excited to get deeper into it. So I you know, clearly recommend everyone with us buy a copy of Genius Foods. And Max, where, where can people reach out and connect with you and learn more about your work? Because Genius Foods is part of what you're doing, is part of what I see as a larger 
platform of Max. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. The best place to find you. Well, definitely I've been most active these days on both uh, Facebook and Instagram, facebook.com slash Max Lugavere. Instagram, my handle is Max Lugavere. People can also come over to my website, maxlugavere.com and say hi to me. Um, people can join my newsletter, which, uh, you know, is the best way for me to get news and information out to you. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm all across the interwebs. So just come say hi. Great. Max, thanks so much. I know you're busy and you've got other interviews today. I appreciate you taking some time for uh, our community. We'll be uh, replaying the webinar. Uh, it'll be uh, on Facebook. It'll be on advancedbrain.com. And then it will also be available in audio in my new podcast, the Advanced, Advanced Brain Podcast, uh, next month. So, Max, thanks. Good Thank to you, see Alex. Good to see you and uh, hope to see you in the analog soon, my friend. Me as well. I can't okay. wait for that.